Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is a new one on the role of the church in the community. This was lesson number two in that series for July 9 of 2016. And this particular lesson is entitled, Restoring Dominion. What do you suppose that means? Well, I hope you have your Bible handy. We would like to begin with a word of prayer as we begin to research this topic. Our wonderful Father, we recognize your presence with us in all that we do. We ask now that somehow or other, by means of the Holy Spirit and with your blessing, our personal lives may lead, others, lead, may lead us and others around us back closer to your original plan for those lives. Help us to understand what it means to restore the dominion that you intended is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We talked in our last week about something about what God, what the sin did to Adam and Eve and the rest of us as human beings. But now, what other effects, besides the direct effects on people, what other effects has sin caused? from that first sin. Well, obviously, Adam and Eve were thrown out of the garden, but Ellen White goes on to say, and this is from Signs of the Times, November 4, 1908, not only man, but the earth also had by sin come under the control of the wicked one and was to be restored by the plan of redemption. Did you know there was a plan of redemption for the earth? At his creation, Adam was placed in dominion over the earth. But by yielding to temptation, he was brought under the power of Satan, and the dominion which he held, that would, means which Adam had, had held, passed to his conqueror. Thus Satan became the god of this world, quote, unquote. And that's, of course, a passage from Scripture, from John. He had usurped that dominion over the earth which had been originally given to Adam. But Christ, by his sacrifice, paying the penalty of sin, whatever that means, would not only redeem man, but recover the dominion which he had forfeited. All that was lost by the first Adam will be restored by the second. There's a lot of interesting ideas in that passage. What does it mean, first of all, just to, to lose our dominion? In our, in our idea, I mean, honestly, the, the idea of dominion has developed some sort of negative connotations. Uh, but certainly back in the Garden of Eden, it didn't have any negative con connotations. So, honestly now, are we still responsible for what is happening to our earth? God seems to hold men accountable in Revelation where he says he's coming back to destroy those who destroy the earth. Yeah. Well, would you feel differently about caring for the environment if you lived in the Garden of Eden? That would be a different situation, wouldn't it? Unfortunately, many people in our world today believe that we came from a long line of one-celled creatures and mollusks and then, you know, all those steps up to apes and finally human beings. If you really believe that evolutionary story, then there's no real reason behind our creation or our lives. There's no valid reason for us to exist. An avowed atheist once struggled with those questions, and she said she wakes up in the middle of the night stressing over a bunch of deep questions. Is this world truly the result of an accidental cosmic Big Bang? How could there be no design, no grand purpose to our existence and to the universe as a whole? Can it be that every life, including my own, my husband's, my children's, is, can it be that they're, they're totally relevant, irrelevant and meaningless? Does my life have no meaning and purpose? Well, what about that? It does have purpose. There is a, it wasn't a result, this world wasn't the result of a Big Bang. It, uh, there is a design. 
You know, one of the things that always amuses me when I hear people talk about the Big Bang is they're trying to say now that maybe our Earth happened because a couple of cosmic, big old cosmic chunks banged into each other. Where the cosmic, where the chunks come from, huh? Well, where did the chunks come from? But, you know, if you could shrink our Earth to the size of a billiard ball, it would be smoother than the billiard ball. So show me how you can take two flying chunks of junk, smash them together, and have them come out perfectly, perfectly smooth. Well, you can have two drops come together, drops of water, and come together, and well, but we're not drops of water. Obviously, we, we more, are more than you think when you look at the planet. There's okay, just a then little just crust the ocean going part across. and just deal with the land part. Tell me how you're going to make that so smooth. It's just as smooth as as the water is. Not it, well, not not as smooth as the water is, but it's it's pretty smooth. Isn't that kind of dependent on size? Because even a billiard ball. If you shrink yourself small enough, you're going to see mountains and valleys on that, on that ball. Mm -hmm. So wh I don't know exactly what your point is. Well, my point is that uh, if you look at the, sometimes they, they try to picture this, and they have these two big chunks of, of I, mostly, I suppose, rock that smash into each other. And oh wow, oh okay. And then the next thing you see is this perfect ball. <laughs> well, the Earth isn't a big rock; it is liquid. I I agree with when that. When you put when you put two liquid, liquid drops together, smash them together, they'll pull in together like a perfect um, ball. And I don't see there's any problem with that myself. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we don't remain. The Earth does not remain as a liquid ball. It has a no. lot of Hard and where did the liquid come from if we just start out with two chunks of rock? No, it, w it was never rock. It was n well, if we don't believe in the creation story and a loving God who created us for his glory, Isaiah 43, 7, then what purpose do our lives really have? Evolutionists believe that eventually our world will, will just burn up or freeze up when our sun burns out. Is that humanity's ultimate destiny? Well, what was God's original plan for us? We're not sure. It was supposed to be an exhibit to the yeah. whole universe. We're supposed to be representing God on a daily basis for the rest of the creation creatures on this world, earth, and for the rest of the universe. 1 Corinthians 4 9 and Ephesians 3 8 to 10. And that is true, especially after the fall. The entire universe will learn a great deal about God as they observe how he deals with our rebellion. What all was involved in our dominion over the creatures, even those in the air and in the sea back in the days of Adam and Eve? Were there any seas in the Garden of Eden? There were rivers, we know that, don't we? I don't know how how big the Garden of Eden was and how much was taken up by water. There wasn't a... Why did you ask that question? I didn't quite get it. Well, God says you're, you're, you have dominion over the birds of the air and over the fish of the sea. Yeah. Where was the sea in the Garden of Eden? Next door. <laughs> okay. You have a verse for that, obviously. Well, it's obvious, isn't it? We don't know. When you have a, when you have a garden, don't you put plant it, plant your plot somewhere, and well, the sea might be over here somewhere? Well, it might be, but you don't have a verse for that. Well, it, it depends how physically you're thinking. Well, I can, <laughs> I can take you to, I'll, I'll take you to my verse. I, I, when I say something, I have a verse for it. Okay. Genesis 2, 10 to 14, I'm not going to read the whole thing. A stream flowed in Eden and watered the garden. Beyond Eden, it divided into four rivers. The first river, and so it says, this says, outside of the garden, there were four rivers. And where do you it names all river? four of them. Where do you think the rivers went to? Well, we don't know. Well, they went to the sea. Well, I'm not arguing with that, but, but <laughs> hold on. Just, <laughs> well, listen to me here. Now, listen to me. How can Adam and Eve be responsible for the fish in the sea if the sea is outside the Garden of Eden? And if there's no rain, how does the 
you know, all the water is eventually going to get down to the sea. You, if are you the sea. are you saying that they were restricted into the Garden of Eden? They couldn't go out. I don't see any reason for them to go out. Do you see any reason for them to go out? Go look at the sea. <laughs> it, it seems to me the word dominion as we understand it, yeah. when the world was as it was then was perfect, is a little different to what we have now. At least he knew if he went out in the field, the tigers weren't going to chew his leg off. Yeah. Uh, he was, he, but in another sense, he was the head keeper of the national park, if you want to use a, low, a current lingo. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as Christians, what do we say is the great purpose of life? Could we honestly say that by the loving ways in which we behave each day, we are correctly representing God, one, to the onlooking universe, and two, to those around us with whom we come in contact? Well, going back to the original Hebrew, Genesis how about, 1. How about we aren't representing God correctly to any of them, probably? Yeah. Genesis 1, 26 to 28 uses some Hebrew words, one that means dominion and one that means subdue. God says subdue these creatures. The Hebrew verb rada indicates a right and a responsibility to rule. How do you think that was actually carried out in the Garden of Eden? Did, God, did Adam and Eve say to the tiger, now you behave because I say so? No, but we know that Adam was given the job to name these various creatures. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind they of were brought to him. The verb subdue from the Hebrew kavash also depicts a hierarchical relationship between humans and the rest of God's creation on this earth. In our day, does the idea of subduing include subjugation or forcing obedience on the other creatures of the earth? Think of the ways in which domestic animals are abused and killed to satisfy the desire for their meat in our day. Would that be considered exploitation? So what about the slaughter? Yeah? What do you think subdue means in that case? Well, I, I'm, I'm fo trying to follow the Hebrew here. The, you use the word subdue, and yeah. they pick that word as a translation for that word, a yeah. Hebrew word. Yeah. Uh, so now you're... It means you're in charge. You're, you're in, they're, they're in your power. Well, not only that, but you become in, put into the power. Yeah, yeah. So... There may be a time where uh, things haven't quite been subdued yet. Yeah. What about, well, but they were subdued in the Garden of Eden. There was no rebellion in the Garden of Eden until Adam and Eve sinned. But you, they were supposed to go out and subdue the yeah. earth. Yeah. So there must have been something that needed to be subdued. Yeah, I, they, were, they were in charge. Or, you know, if plants will just grow, you know. Uh, we've got these grapevines that just mm -hmm. took off from small little plants that we forgot about, and they climb over the fence and they wander all over. So they just they're just going without any particular guidance or direction. But they could be trained if yeah. if you had somebody uh, mm -hmm. working on those. Well, in <laughs> terms of the use of animals, what about the slaughter of the lambs in the Old Testament? Is that a good use of animals? Well, it was directed by God, wasn't yeah. it? That's what it I'm asking. As, it, was, it wasn't his original plan, though. Yeah. But it still was directed by God. Yeah. Well, Genesis 2.15 says some interesting stuff. Look at this. Then the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and guard it. Uh, the, the King James uses some more archaic words. He says, to keep and dress it. What does that mean? Well, the Hebrew words abad and shamar suggest that he was to work, to serve, to till or cultivate, to hedge about, to guard, to protect, attend to, look narrowly, observe, preserve, regard, or reserve that over which we have dominion. Those are, that's, that's what a good you know, you know, bilingual dictionary will tell you. Another an interesting word is guard. Mm -hmm. How would he? What would he be guarding from? Yeah. Well, that's those are just words that we use now, 
uh, to ascribe uh, to that meaning. Ways in which that word is translated in other right. parts of the Bible. Yeah. So it applies to our world now. It doesn't necessarily apply to yeah. the way things were but then, but just but in the same way using, that... They're still using that word, though. Yeah. Yeah, but, but we're Bible. using it in d different ways because we're... Uh, we're, uh, yeah. we're in a world of sin. Obviously, now. words cha gradually change their meaning over time. So, you know, it didn't necessarily have all the meanings back in the Garden of Eden that it does now. Um, does that mean that we are free to do... Oh, I'm sorry, what is implied by having dominion over, quote, all the earth, close quote? Does that mean that we are free to do whatever we like with that over which we have dominion? Would that be good stewardship? Or does good stewardship have boundaries? Clearly, there were boundaries intended for Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. The tree of knowledge of good and evil was supposed to be off limits, right? Yeah. By stepping over their bounds or out of the bounds of God's plan for their lives, Adam and Eve plunged all of us into the great controversy and into sin. <coughs> that disaster continues until our day. So, in what ways does humanity overstep its boundaries in caring for our world today? A large segment of humanity has no concept of looking after anything like that anymore. Yeah. Are we overstepping our boundaries by polluting water and air? Are we overstepping our boundaries as we destroy animal life and we destroy habitat so great numbers of species of creatures in the world are, 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 are disappearing? Are we, are we overstepping our boundaries by global warming? Are we overstepping our boundaries by raising meat just for human consumption? Which, by the way, is one of the largest causes of carbon dioxide production in the whole world. You know, the only thing that bothers me about those things you're putting out there, we've got people that are multiplying over the earth. Mm -hmm. God said to multiply over the earth. He didn't say, stop, with no. this enough. There's nowhere in the Bible where he says that. No. So how do you know that, his, that we're fulfilling some sort of design here? Well, well go ahead. Uh, sorry, I was going to say, but we are quite clearly told that the earth is waxing old like a garment. Mm -hmm. But that is our fault. You don't know that. How do we it know? It covers a whole multitude of sins, as the saying goes. Mm -hmm. Well, when you wax old, that means you just get old. Should, you're, should getting worn <laughs> out. you're getting worn out. That's uh, also a part of getting old. Should the rich people be, be taking more responsibility for the poor people? Probably, yeah. Well, Exodus 20, 1 to 20, tells us what? What do we find in Exodus 20? Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. Oh, right. And a little introduction and a little sequel. In looking at that, we don't have time to read all of it right now. In looking at the Ten Commandments, what was God's intention? And what was the human response? Well, they, they were down there with their faces in the dirt, weren't they? Well, what does the Ten Commandments really say to us? Here's, a, here's a, something for you to think about. The first commandment tells us to worship God exclusively. The second commandment tells us to worship God directly and not through any substitutes. The third commandment tells us to worship God sincerely and not flippantly or disrespectfully. The fourth commandment tells us to worship God with all our hearts, regularly and repeatedly every seventh day. The last six commandments we speak of, our, speak of our responsibilities to other human beings. We are to honor our parents. We are to honor human life, our marriages, the truth, other people's property, and we're not even to want to commit any of the above sins. There's an almost endless list of human dictators, despots, and people of various kinds of authority who have abused their rule over others. Can you think of some examples from the Bible? Pharaoh? Yeah. Herod? Even the kings of Israel and Judah. Yeah. 
But Satan is the ultimate abuser of others. Think about Revelation 13. Wow. Satan and those under his control will abuse and control others over whom they have no rightful dominion. Since we're talking about dominion. In light of that, what will be the cause of the seven last plagues? What do you think? That's a huge theological question. Most so-called theologians, because of the initial wording in, in Revelation 15, believe that the seven last plagues are sent as a punishment on man because we're sinners. And sent by God is what they Sent think. by God, yes. And my question is, could we be... Could they be caused by our own abuse of the environment around us through misuse, pollution, or even war? Well, uh, there's a passage where it talks about uh, the angels holding back the four winds of strife to keep yep. them from Revelation falling Revelation 7. So when those angels are let go, let go, then those winds of strife blow. And that Does that mean God's responsible for it or he's been holding it back, and then we let's go. Satan is responsible for it. We're responsible for it. Who makes it happen when God lets go? So is that our job, to find out who's responsible? Well, it would be useful to know, wouldn't it? Well, if you, uh, if you I, I, get I guess, to it right. I guess the most important thing to say is this. Why do so many people think that God is responsible? Because I don't. I don't think God is responsible for what happens in the seven last plagues. I think there's very good, careful, exegetical reasons for believing that it's not God who's responsible. So we're responsible and we, we cause the seven last plagues? Well, there's, there's a combination of things. Obviously, we don't have time to talk about all those things right now. No, but Ephesians God six. isn't. God it has nothing to do with it. Ephesians 6. Well, God has this much to do with it. He's been holding back the winds of strife and now he lets go. He let go. He's, he's responsible. He allows it. Mm -hmm. He allowed it. He allowed it. He so it happened. Or allowed it. That's right. So who's so responsible? If, if, you, if you take that approach, then you make God responsible for every evil thing that ever happens. Because well, isn't he, he the creator? What? Isn't he the creator? So, and that's the isn't added... Isn't he the one that granted... Granted freedom? Yes. Well, but he's, in, in he's ultimately re if, responsible if he'd have because it, the buck stops with the Creator. And if he had let it happen a long time ago, there would be nothing here. It would be just self-destruction. Self Seems to me Sin it's somewhat is similar a destroyer. to uh, Christ and the disciples were crossing the lake and the yeah. devil tried to drown them all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Same idea. Yeah. Except in, in yeah. our case now, we know this is a sign of the coming end. One of the signs. Well, in terms of dominion, here's a thought. Does God intend for us to be in control of our own selves? That's Exercising self-control. Fruit of the Spirit, isn't it? Yeah. Galatians 5. So the fruit of the Spirit, you just said the fruit of the Spirit, and he asked, is it, are, are we supposed to be in control? Of ourselves. So yeah. how does that happen without the Spirit? It won't. It won't. So you need the Spirit. Mm -hmm. yeah. spirit you need the Spirit. You, spirit spirit of truth. Yeah, spirit. And, and the Spirit of truth works on your brain. Sin starts in your brain. And it's only that's what needs healing. It isn't my pancreatic cancer or whatever other malady I have. It's the way I think about God. God the way God runs the universe, God is on trial. Mm -hmm. is he tell, has he been telling the truth or is he a liar? Spirit gives us a choice. Mm -hmm. Without access to God through the Spirit, we have no concept. We're left to mm -hmm. just temporal uh, things, and we don't. But but with Jesus, then we have a choice, mm -hmm. uh, and we can choose life or we can choose death, as we've. Okay, here's well, if God is love. We could only have, he could only create intelligent creatures that have the capacity yeah. to make a choice. Yeah. It's just like two and two is four. Yeah. Every good gift, I'm reading now from James 1.17. How much do you think is included in this? Every good gift and every perfect present 
comes from heaven. It comes down from God, the creator of the heavenly lights, who does not change or cause darkness by turning. So everything that we have here on planet Earth, that's a good or bad, if we follow Gary's logic, which is correct, uh, it comes from God, ultimately. There would be nothing here if it weren't for what? For God. Are we then recognizing our God-given limits and boundaries as we deal with family, friends, even co-workers? What would happen if we actually succeeded in practicing the golden rule, seeking to always do good and not evil? What would happen? <laughs> different, different world, wouldn't it? Wow. It would be. In a, if you did everything other-centered, always did things out of love, you couldn't sin. Mm -hmm. You couldn't. I mean, you wouldn't sin, I guess. Uh, but I mean, if, if you can... <laughs> yeah. We still have the choice. Yeah. So I uh, guess the capacity to, to, to make the false cho wrong choice is there. After Adam and Eve sinned, all of nature seemed to rebel against them. As we look around the world in our day, do we seem to be powerless in the face of the elements, weather, agriculture, the animal kingdom? Ellen White says these words, Among the lower creatures, Adam had stood as king, and so long as he remained loyal to God, all nature acknowledged his rule. But when he transgressed, this dominion was forfeited. The spirit of rebellion to which he himself had given entrance extended throughout the animal creation. Thus, not only the life of man, but the nature of the beasts, the trees of the forest, the grass of the field, the very air he breathed, all told the sad lesson of the knowledge of evil. Education's pages 26 and 27. We, we hear almost every day about disasters happening one place or another. Weather and, and deteriorating ecosystems and do we blame God for all that? Now, Gary, here's your chance. What's God's that? responsible for all that. He's responsible for all the hurricanes and all the typhoons and all the... Well, the system was He's created allowing by them, God. He's allowing them, isn't he? The system was created by God. Okay, so Adam and Eve weren't responsible at all. Weren't responsible? No. So if, God's if God is completely responsible, then Adam and Eve were not responsible. So you're saying a bit, a lapse of behavior caused all this. I'm asking, I asked you the question. Separate well, that's what, you're, yeah. that's what you're trying to get me to say. Yeah. Well, that that a lapse ours, of does, does behavior our, made all these, all these hurricanes, all these natural disasters happen. Everything. If, yeah, and, and, and you said, and, and, and there's, there's, a, a, there's a definitely some truth to it, that if God didn't allow it, it couldn't happen. There's always that. But has our sin, now let's talk about my sins and your sins. Has our sin, or our sins, somehow caused all of those problems? Or is God just allowing Satan to have more and more control of this earth? Of course, he wouldn't have to let Satan have control of this earth if we hadn't sinned, right? You know, the Lord disciplines those that, that he loves. Is that he what, is, is, that he is he a teacher. Satan? He is a teacher that's a disciplining teacher. Well, is, what, what, what we have today is, is the knowledge of good and evil. We had a perfect world. That's what God made. Mm -hmm. And by choosing... Uh, by Adam and Eve choosing to separate themselves from God, the creation was in some ways separated also. Mm -hmm. So that we have evil as well mm -hmm. as good. So, And the Bible says, Isaiah 45. Tim, your favorite, one of your favorite verses. Well, it generally says, I create light or create darkness, I make wheel and make bow, I'm God, I do all these things. However, there's a, we probably ought to re reword that. Yeah. Because uh, God... Gives us choice to to exercise. Well, but what? Let's just stop and ask this question: If Satan had his complete freedom, what would he do with this world? Destroy it. Destroy it. That is what he's doing. And us, we, well, and who would he destroy first of all? Probably God's himself. The Christians. Well, as God's what, people. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Of course. Uh, so you're just saying that he would just destroy everything if he had. 
Oh, yeah. I, I thought he was trying to lead us astray yeah. mentally. I mean, to go just blow everything up isn't going to do anything. This, this is the way I understand it. If, God, if, if Satan were given complete freedom, he would destroy everyone on this earth who's trying to follow God. Then he would turn to God and he'd say, okay, you can have the rest of the universe. It's yours. I'm not going to argue with about Just leave this world to me and my people. The insanity of, of that, though, is yeah. he thinks he's self-existent. Yeah. Okay? I mean, it, it, he, no intelligent creature is self-existent. They're, they're all a product of the Creator. But is, crea is caring for our earth a moral, ethical, and theological issue? It depends. If you get, it doesn't help. Well, I think you, can get, you can get people to actually, for the earth's sake, mm -hmm. to kill people. To, to wipe off um, populations. That's what I mean, there's, there's actually people saying that. The Georgia Guidestones. Yes. So, um, just saying, you know, whether you're taking care of the earth or not isn't going to answer the whole thing. Yeah. Because you can have people bring up their own ideas on how to keep care of the earth. Okay, you may not know, but we have, in the Adventist Church, we have a quote, Official Statement of the Seventh-day Adventist Church on Environment. This was written in 1995, so it's not, it's 20, more than 20 years old now. Seventh-day Adventists advocate a simple, wholesome lifestyle where people do not step on the treadmill or unbridled consumer, the treadmill of unbridled consumerism, goods getting, and production of waste. We call for respect of creation, Restraint in the use of the world's resources, reevaluations of one's needs, and reaffirmation of the dignity of created life. How does that grab you? Well, I think this, it gets back to your original statement. I think, yes, we are, believing as we do, we are beholden to those different precepts or conceptions what said but the civilization of the world as it is now we don't have a lot of direct content of being able to influence it there are people i guess these are people be maybe the people in the epa who almost worship the environment and the earth so how how can we i mean what's going to happen to our world eventually to be wonder. It's, going to be it's going to be completely wiped out. The old world is going to be wiped out and a new earth is going to be created. So would it be correct for us to say, forget it, doesn't matter, let it go to waste, because God's going to make a new one anyway? I think what's going to happen is that uh, there's, we know it's coming, a one world government, and they use some of this to bring it about. There's, there's going to be some tremendous changes that I don't think we fully realize. Well, let's take your, your question there and um, say that the Lord is going to recreate the whole world. Well, then what is the purpose of worrying about whether or not you're preserving the old one or not? That was are my question. Are you being self-centered or are you being other-centered? That's a bad example. If we don't. That's a, but, you well, know, you've got, you've got lots of, I mean, people in the United States, they, they love to the be better their family life and like to build nice houses for their families and all this stuff. When they do that, some people say they're harming the earth. Depends so on, depends on how they So do here it. you are trying to do good for your family, good for the community, make you know everybody's be profitable and whatever and happy. And yet at the same time we're we're belching out all the CO2, mm -hmm. and it's causing the earth to get warmer, they say. Which is good, which is making more, far more uh, vegetation. So the, the earth years ago was well, probably... Well, that's your far, opinion. Well, it's I mean, the, you don't, not you just don't. mine. I, I, I look at evidence. I mean, I don't obviously don't waste any sleeping time on work. Well, I, I don't waste any sleeping time over here either, but um, well, I'm just yeah. listening to all these arguments. and Most of them are... Worth. Here's, here's what God says about one of the things that God says about all that Romans 1 25 they exchange the truth about God for a lie they worship and serve what God has created 
instead of the Creator Himself, who is to be praised forever. Amen. So are there people out there who basically, I mean, what are evolutionists saying? Aren't they basically worshiping what God has created yep. instead of the Creator Himself? And they also say that the earth is built on such a precarious thing that if you get anything a little bit out of balance, you could wreck the whole thing. We're, we're going to talk about that. And in a um, yeah, well, then you kind of think that God isn't a very good designer to make the earth so fragile. Tectonic so, movements. How does the life and death of Jesus restore our dominion? Will that take place only after the third coming? There are numerous passages, both in Scripture and in the writings of Ellen White, which suggest that God will restore things to an even better condition than the original Garden of Eden. Considering the fact that we know that our world is going to be completely destroyed and remade, should we just give up and say whatever happens will happen? Occupy till I come. Yeah. yeah. If you're a non-believer, yeah. there's good reasons to be worried about it. There are a lot of verses in the Bible, and here's a, let's read two or three of them. Uh, let me pick Luke 14, 13, and 14. When you give a feast, invite the poor, the, cripple, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they are not able to pay you back. God will repay you on the day the good people rise from death. So would you call that a long-term investment? Yeah, for eternity. So how many of us make a regular practice of inviting people that we know for sure can't invite us back? Pretty tough to, to find some that you know for sure. <laughs> That's pretty dangerous. Some of those people are days. pretty good frauds. Some, some cases it might be dangerous. That's right. Yes, definitely. Well, look at 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16. But have reverence for Christ in your hearts and honor Him as Lord. Be ready at all times to answer anyone who, answers, who asks you to explain the hope you have in you, but do it with gentleness and respect. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are insulted, those who speak evil of your good conduct as followers of Christ will be ashamed of what they say. Are we prepared to speak to anyone who asks us about the hope that's within us? Well, these verses, and there's a bunch of others. Deuteronomy 15, 7 to 15. I read Luke 14, 13 to 14. 1 Peter 3, 15 to 16. There's also James 1, 27, Isaiah 58, 7, and 2 Thessalonians 3, 10. These verses emphasize the fact that we should reach out to the poor and needy. We should invite them to our homes and feed them when we have opportunity. But we also need to share the gospel with them. As Paul stated in 2 Thessalonians 3, 10, we should not encourage them to be lazy and idle. He said, whoever refuses to work is not allowed to eat. And I struggle with that one. I'll tell you why I struggle with that. I worked in a, in a clinic that's set up primarily to take care of poor people. And there's a lot of people who come, from my, come to my clinic who, for whatever reason, and it's not always clear, are on, let's say, SSI. And what do you do all day? Sit and watch television. Yeah. Is that what God intended? No. Now, obviously, there's some people who are totally incapable. But there's an awful lot of people who look like they could work well. They could, they could just as well be working. And they're not. So, that's one of the... Uh, lots of children that don't have enough to eat. They're lucky to get one meal a day in this country. But it happens every day. So what are we doing to restore dominion to the poor that are among us? Are we going beyond our requirements if we provide not only help for their physical needs, but also spiritual help? I think well, it's tied together, huh. or should be. Yeah. Yeah. Just to feed them doesn't restore their dominion. It, no. it makes them dependent on us. So to restore their dominion would would be to teach them how to uh, provide for their own needs. Uh, and and you know the old story. It's been very, many, many people have used this as an illustration. It's one thing to give a person a fish. It's something else to teach them how to fish. Right. 
Um, well, uh, in our daily lives, are we becoming beacons of light and hope to those in need? Are we correctly representing Jesus Christ by our daily lives? Immersed in our sinful world, as it, it is hard for us to imagine really what it was like in the Garden of Eden. What would it be like? Try to imagine what would it be like to speak with God face to face, face and do it comfortably. I don't have enough data to answer that. You don't have enough data to answer that. Okay. Our, will, our wills have become corrupted, and so there's resistance to God and His will. So in our present state, we can't really even imagine what yeah. that would be like in terms of comfort. For 1 Corinthians 2.9 says just exactly that. We, we can't even imagine. Well, what were the immediate results? We've talked about the immediate results of sin, but think about it. Genesis 3, 17 and 18, there was the thorn and the thistle. Genesis 7, 12, there was the aftermath of the flood. Genesis, I'm sorry, Romans 8, 19 to 22, the desert and the wilderness, the groaning of the earth for deliverance, are some of the word pictures the Bible uses to describe the effect of sin upon the world. We truly cannot even imagine. Let me just read that verse I, that I mentioned, 1 Corinthians 2, 9. However, as the scripture says, what no one ever saw or heard, what no one ever thought could happen, is the very thing God prepared for those who love him. We can't even imagine it. Okay. How much longer do you think our world can survive? Do you see any trends in the world that seem to suggest it's trying to destroy itself? We're trying to destroy it or whatever. I think it's well along. I'd go a whole lot longer. I think Jesus in Matthew 24 talks about uh, time, time, something to the effect of time being cut short, otherwise no one yep. would be left alive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and geneticists, or at least one that I read, talked about how our uh, the uh, the DNA? DNA is breaking down. The errors are piling up. And Genetic a, entropy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. John so, Sanford. Right. So there's, uh, there's a, uh, a point in which uh, things would collapse if time went on. So God will intervene. And even, even earlier that, we have enough bombs stored in silos ready to be fired to completely annihilate the world an estimated 12 times. What does that tell you? We've got too many bombs. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I mean, well, Don't let it to fall into the wrong hands. Exactly. What would happen if, if ISIS got a hold of some of those bombs, for example? If you look at the Middle East, the, the desert all through that area, and then you look down at the Amazon Basin as we speak, it's all, they reckon it's already starting to affect uh, currents and warmth and stuff. I mean, we're just tearing it all apart as yeah. hard as we can. Yep. About the length of time the Earth could go, I think it was in last week's lesson, Ellen White said in the 1800s, don't plan for one or two years, but don't plan for 20 or 10 years. For God, for Jesus to come back yet. Jesus to come yet back. Well, we know that everything living on planet Earth is interconnected. Is it possible that we could pollute our way to destruction if God did not, did not intervene in time? Yeah. Are, do we have a responsibility to be good stewards of our Earth? Or are the effects of what our ancestors and others who lived on our planet in the past so are they so overwhelming that anything we could do now would not make any difference anyway? Do you think that the results of sin is just going to manifest itself in pollution? Well, I mean, is that is do that do what I, the do whole? I think pollution is a result of, of no, no, human no. greed. Yes, it sounds like it sounds like everything's winding up to the earth being polluted and that's going to cause the seven last plagues. That's a possibility. 
that I mean that's what it sounds like here. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that's the end of it? That's what the great controversy is trying to just tell us that we've got to not pollute the earth. Well, that's one of the questions. It's not just. I mean, we have to not only not pollute it; we have to care for it. How are we doing that? So, so are we? Is that where the final answer is coming from? Whether or not we're well, going to keep I, care of the earth? It's pretty clear that. The, the plan of salvation isn't based on how well we care for the earth. There's, there's more involved than that. In trying to understand the significance of our dominion over the lower creatures of the earth, could we learn something by how God exercises his dominion over us? Is it God who will destroy the earth or us? What would happen if we started a nuclear World War III? I think Einstein it got it right. Soon after World War II and the dropping of the first nuclear bombs, it, was re it is reported that someone asked Einstein what kind of weapons would be used in World War III. And you could imagine, I mean, that would be an obvious question, right? Because here you have World War I, World War II, and now at the end of World War II you have nuclear weapons. So it, it seems like a pretty logical question. His response was, I don't know. But I can tell you what kind of weapons they will use in World War IV. And, and the questioner was somewhat surprised and asked, what kind of weapons? And Einstein's response was, rocks. Rocks. Yeah. <laughs> no. If there's anyone there. He, he was implying that everything would, be, everything would be destroyed by a major nuclear war on planet Earth. He had no illusions about it at all. Well, is it a sin to use more than our share of the Earth's resources? <coughs> Americans certainly have lived wastefully with respect to the Earth's resources for a long period of time. My family, my children grew up in Africa. I was working as a missionary there for 17 years. And we would go back and forth every three years or so for a furlough. And we would come home here and we would say, well, welcome back to the throwaway society. Yeah. You go to Africa, rural Africa, Everything is saved and used. Was when I was a child. Probably here too. So you don't think that would have happened to them if they had the technological? Oh, um, I'm not. I'm not saying it, but we, we are the ones who have done it. We've done what? Created a throwaway society. The irony of everything is being. I mean, look at the <laughs> trash. The trash trucks full of junk that come by every yeah. week. Yeah, every Three day. of them go by my house every week. Yeah. So is that, how does that go back to the Ten Commandments? Well, because you say, you're saying there that um, this, the, the earth deteriorating like that is part of sin. Yes. So what part of the Ten Commandments is being broken I, there to I, make I, all the trash? I happen? think we are disrespecting God by the way we abuse the earth. To me, the irony of it is believing the prophecies as we do. We know when America, America arose. And when you look at it today, for all our waste, we're still setting sitting rather on phenomenal piles of energy. Mm -hmm. It's just what man has done to use it that is so wrong as far yeah. as health reasons. Well, as Seventh-day Adventists, we choose to worship the God whom we believe is our creator. We do not worship created things, but do we sometimes idolize things in this life? Very easy to. What should be the correct hierarchy in God's universe? Well, God is certainly, I, I mean, at least all the, theoretically, we would all say, no, God is up here. What comes under God in our usual thinking? Angels. The angels. Where would you put the beings in the other, other worlds? Same. With the angels. Yeah. And then who comes next? Us. us probably. What comes under us? The animals. The animals. Okay. So are you inventing a caste system here? Well, we're just trying to understand <laughs> what's going on. Well, we always need to understand it in terms of the way God does things. As Jesus said, the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over you, but it shall not be so with you. Let yeah. he that be first among you be servant of all. Exactly. And Jesus, of course, came to serve. So 
uh, a lot of times we have to flip things. Or, you know, if we're if we're looking at it just from a temporal, carnal view, uh, we can get confused. But we have to kind of flip it around and see it through spiritual eyes. Uh, how God is talking about dominion. It's in terms of mm -hmm. ministering, of serving, of giving. Yeah. Well, we've already talked a little bit about evolutionists and their attitudes. Uh, they're clearly trying to blur the boundary between human beings and animals. But the Bible makes it very clear that only human beings were made in God's image. Can we honestly claim to be different from the animals? Could you explain that difference successfully to an evolutionist? I don't know if it would make any difference. <laughs> That's not the root of their, their uh, thought process. It's just a manifestation of it. Well, in the beginning, God gave Adam and Eve a wonderful diet of fruits, nuts, and grains. The serpent tried to convince Eve that their diet was not complete. He said that if she would just taste of the forbidden fruit, she would be even wiser, in fact, become like God. That is a technique we call what? Spin. Spin in which the truth is changed or twisted to imply something which it does not mean. Spin makes the real unreal and makes the unreal seem real. How does spin affect our lives today? Politicians hire them to straighten <laughs> yeah. things out or wow. twist Where you them look. the other way. How much of what we hear in the public media is corrupted by spin? <laughs> you can't avoid it. Yeah. yeah. Except for Fox. In the original, in Genesis 3, 1 to 4, the serpent almost implies that God had forbidden Adam and Eve to eat from any tree in the garden. If you read the Hebrew, if you understand the Hebrew, it says, did God say you couldn't eat from any tree in the garden? Now, we don't usually translate it that way, but that's probably what's he implying. That, of course, was absolutely not true. Then the serpent, in effect, said, well, then you can eat of every tree, right? And we know what happened. Well, look at Mark 10, 37. They answered, when you sit on your throne, this is James and John and their mother talking to Jesus. When you sit on your throne in, the, in your glorious kingdom, we want you to let us sit with you, one at your right and, uh, and one at your left. How do you think Jesus felt when they said that to him? Well, first of all, what do you think she meant by that? Well, obviously, they, they believed that Jesus was about to set up his earthly kingdom. And he, she wanted her two sons to sit on his right and his left to be prime ministers or whatever, the, to be the... Well, that's possible on this earth, but Jesus switched to the, the, his mind to in heaven. Mm -hmm. And then, it, then if you do that, well, then that whole request seems ridiculous. Well, was, was Jesus seriously disappointed when he heard that? He was probably very sad. Yeah. By washing the disciples' feet on that incredible final evening he had with them, he gave the ultimate lesson, suggesting that those who are Christian leaders are leaders because they serve others. Have we learned that lesson? If everyone in the Adventist church was prepared to exercise his or her abilities in that direction, how would it affect the world? Can you think of any truly great people who have exhibited the kind of true greatness that characterized Jesus? Many of you have probably heard the, and it's reported in different ways, what Gandhi said about Christianity. Christianity is a wonderful religion. I, I just wish we could see some of it. Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> Pets are something we talk a lot about. People, some people, pets are their whole lives almost. Yeah. But uh, do we sometimes treat our pets better than we treat other human beings? Many do. Many do. Some of them eat better than a lot of human beings. Yeah. Deuteronomy 15, 7 to 15, Luke 14, 30, 13 to 14, and so forth. There's a whole list of verses there. Talk about that. These verses emphasize the fact that we should reach out to the poor and needy we should invite them to our homes and feed them when we have opportunity. But we also need to share the gospel with them. As Paul stated in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, um, we should not encourage them to be lazy and idle. He said, whoever refuses to work 
is not allowed to eat. Now, I missed something I wanted to talk about a little back up here somewhere, but let, let me just touch on it very briefly. If we believe in the evolutionary sort of approach to things, there's no meaning to anything. But when we look at the world and the universe, we see, and some, one of you mentioned that earlier, that our world, our universe, is very, very precisely organized and arranged. There are some constants that are so precise that, I mean, you, it, there's hundreds and thousands of, of digits of, of, if it's just off by just a tiny little bit, the, the, our world couldn't exist. How could people who, who believe in evolution, how could they see all that and still think it all happened by chance? Yeah. They create multiple universe. In other words, if there's billions and billions of universes, mm -hmm. ours just happens to be the one. The lucky one. Yeah, the lucky one. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that means we our our world works by a different set of of, of laws of different laws of physics in those worlds out there. That's their argument. Yeah. But the, but when they study the stars and when they study astronomy, they apply all of the rules that we have here. To those worlds out there. Right. Well, they're talking about randomness. They're, they're when you have random, when you yeah. have a random things happening and create this universe, a random thing over here happens. You're going to get billions of different universes with okay. different random orders, oh. and then you got this one here that just happens to be right on. All of that, I'm not ridiculous, but <laughs> all of that I'm not arguing with. But you see, if you say that, if you're saying there's complete different principles, completely random principles, and we just happen to be the lucky ones, that means all those worlds out there are operating by different principles than what we operate by. No, so you, not you can't necessarily. It's not. It's not the principles. It's it's the random, the random things that happen. Yeah. Anyway. We ask you to think about some of these things. We have just raised a lot of questions that we haven't even begun to answer. And so we'll throw it into your lap. It's your, in your court now. How do you answer those questions? Our kind and loving Father, as we think about these horrendous questions that we have looked at, we've studied two lessons now, a couple of weeks, looking at dominion, looking at restoration, and what you did in the beginning and what, how far we've come away from that. Help us to do our best to make it possible for you to come again soon and restore all things. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.